Okay, so uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and what you do here at the embassy. Okay, I'm Nathalie Loiseau, I'm the spokesperson of the French Embassy here in Washington. Okay, and so when you look at um, this time period of from August to uh, March 17th or March 19th, how would you kind of describe uh, what your job was like here? Well, I arrived here in August 2002 at the very moment where the focus was beginning to be on Iraq and what had to be done uh, to have uh, Iraq disarmed. So it was 99% uh, of my job was to explain to uh, American media uh, what was our position, France's position on Iraq, which was stated very early by the French president in an interview to the New York Times. It was, I think, uh, September 9th, 2002. Okay, and so um, uh Tell me a little bit about uh, how easy of a job it was to describe uh, what your actual positions were or, you know, go into a little bit about, you know, when interacting with the journalists. Well, it was a challenging moment for, uh, for us, uh, both because there was high, a very high level of interest for France's position, uh, much more, for instance, that for position of other members of the Security Council. Very rapidly, the American media saw the discussions about Iraq as a dispute, as a, a divergence between France and the United States, which was uh, false on several ways. That is, uh, it was not France alone which was advocating for uh, inspections and uh, uh, advocating caution about uh, a military option. Uh, there were a lot of countries which were uh, on the same position. And the idea was not to be against the United States, but the idea was to try to have a united international community finding the most effective and less dangerous way to have Iraq disarmed. But from day one, the idea in the media was to say there is a dispute between two old allies, this is France and the United States. And it was very hard to uh, get out of this first impression. So even uh, before 1441 was passed, you're saying that the media was casting this as a U.S. versus France? Yes, and uh, it was one of our uh, problems, if I may say so. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm going to be uh, deleting my uh, question. Okay, so I have to repeat some, right. some way so that people understand. Uh, from beginning, even before 1441, uh, there was a sort of a bias in the media, the way they were seeing it was um, that uh, there was a dispute between France and the United States, not at all that there were discussions in the Security Council about a very serious issue which was disarming Iraq and after 1441 whether military force was necessary. Uh, there was certainly lack of knowledge from a lot of media about what a discussion in the Security Council is and stands for. That is, they were focusing about uh, French statements as, as there were statements from other countries that they were not interested in. Uh, they were not really following what Hans Blix for the UN Melvik and uh, Mohamed El Baradai for IAEA were saying at the same time. We had very high uh, media exposure uh, not exactly um, uh, a precise and an accurate one, to say the truth. So what you're saying is that you got a lot of coverage that there was a dispute, mm -hmm. but not a lot of what you actually were, were saying. Can you go into that? Or? Well, uh, I must pay tribute to American journalists because uh, they were extremely interesting, interested in what we were saying. Um, some had already knowledge about what was happening in the United Nations and it was making things easier. Others were completely discovering UN, which is something a little bit special and which is very American. I mean, many American journalists had very little knowledge about UN resolutions, the way you negotiate them, what they mean. Uh, it, w it was making things more difficult, obviously. It, so do you see this, um, this sense that, you know, uh, one thing that American journalists I saw were saying that the United States has this right to enforce all these resolutions and, 
Yeah, not saying that it's actually the Security Council's job to decide. Well, uh, indeed, there is a big difference between the United States and uh, most of the other Western countries. That is, that international law is not automatically enforced in the American um, uh, state of law. Uh, international law is not considered superior to domestic law in the United States. Whereas, for instance, in France and in uh, other Western countries, international law is considered superior. So there was a difference of perspective from the very beginning, of course. Uh, but I must say there is a big difference for me, to my view, uh, between um, staff writers, reporters, who were trying to know as much as possible about our positions and about what was happening in the United Nations, what was happening at AIAEA, and uh, editorial writers, who to me seems to have their opinion made from the very beginning. That is, that uh, Saddam Hussein was a danger for the United States, that he was a threat, and that after September 11, America could not afford to ignore such a threat. And whatever was said was considered as uh, friendly or hostile to this so-called obvious position. Did you see a lot of uh, journalists seeing war as inevitable? Uh, what I must say, and uh, it, it really amazed me, is that uh, during that period I had maybe 30 to 40 journalists a day, either on the phone or in my office, or I was meeting them. Um, a vast majority of them uh, were either opposed to a war or cautious or reluctant. But at the same time, they were all considering that war was coming, that nothing could be done to avoid the war. So they didn't really understand why we were uh, sticking to our principles uh, at a moment where, in their view, what would be coming. And uh, so when you uh, look at this time period of uh, the eight weeks of trying to get 1441, what, from your sense, what was the United States trying to do during that time period, and what was France trying to stop the United States from doing? Well, um, when we worked together to uh, get 1451, we were not trying to block the United States uh, of doing something special. We, were, uh, we had all come to a, a common conclusion, United States, France, and uh, most of the members of the Security Council, which was to say um, we have things that we don't know about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. We have doubts. We have suspicions. We have unanswered questions. And it has lasted for too long, though we have to um, put more pressure on Saddam Hussein and show him that there is uh, unanimity in the international community and he has to disarm. This is the point we had reached at the end of summer 2002. And uh, when President Bush came to the United Nations General Assembly on September the 12th and said that uh, basically Iraq had a last chance to disarm, uh, he was unanimously supported. Everybody was in the same mood, which was to say, uh, this time, one and f once and for all, Saddam has to show goodwill, has to disarm. The inspectors have to go back to Iraq. And we were in France among the countries which had regretted that the uh, inspectors were withdrawn from Iraq in 1998. Uh, so we were all sharing the same objective, full, uh, controllable, and monitorable disarmament of Iraq. Uh, this is the reason why we started discussing uh, a draft resolution, and this is the reason why we were able to adopt Resolution 1441 unanimously, uh, which was a big achievement, for instance, unanimously was meaning having Syria on board voting for the resolution. And uh, there seemed to be a discussion about uh, making this a two-stage process versus a uh, no hidden triggers and yeah. no automaticity. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, this was really uh, the heart of France's position. And uh, we expressed it very clearly uh, in September 9th interview of the president with the New York Times. Uh, that is to say, uh, we wanted to have the inspectors back in Iraq. 
uh, we wanted them to assess the situation because they had been absent from Iraq for years. And obviously, the serious, uh, valuable uh, information we had on weapons of mass destruction and the serious results we had had of, on destruction of weapons of mass destruction were due to inspections between 91 and uh, 98. So we wanted to have the inspectors back in Iraq. We wanted to have them do their, do their job, assess the situation, tell the Security Council what was going on. And then we wanted the Security Council to be the international body taking a decision about war or peace. We were not hostile to war uh, in any case. That is, we had considered that in case Saddam Hussein would have cheated, in case the inspections would have been impossible, what was qualified as a material breach, uh, we might have decided uh, the use of force and we would, as friends, have participated in a, in a military action in Iraq. But we wanted first that the assessment uh, would be made by Yun Mavik and IAEA, and second, that the decision to go to war to enforce UN Security Council resolutions uh, would be taken by the UN Security Council. And uh, what did uh, John Mancoponte mean when he said there are no hidden triggers and no automaticity? Well, obviously, uh, we had a sense that in the American administration there were divergences about uh, the role of the United Nations in the decision to go to war. Some were uh, acknowledging the, um, the fact that in the UN Charter uh, you are allowed to go to war in very specific circumstances. And uh, in that circumstances, which was to enforce UN Security Council resolutions, obviously you needed to have approval from the United Nations Security Council. Uh, in other parts of the administration, uh, the idea of going to the UN to get an authorization was strongly rejected, obviously. And what was uh, France's interpretation of, of what actually happened? Was it set out and did you expect it to have a second resolution um, before war would be authorized or did you uh, believe the, uh, the, the U.S. legal argument? Authority? Well, obviously, uh, to our view, there was a need to have a second resolution uh, in order to be able to uh, use force. Uh, and this is what was written in 1451, to our view, to our uh, reading of the resolution. Uh, we, when we voted the resolution, we had no knowledge of what would be the behavior of Saddam Hussein uh, towards the return of the inspectors and towards um, uh, letting inspections go on without any obstacle. Uh, and what happened was that step by step, uh, from the moment the inspectors were back in Iraq, which was late November, uh, until they had to leave uh, early March, uh, step by step, there was first passive cooperation from uh, Saddam Hussein and then active cooperation. Passive cooperation was already a progress uh, compared to uh, 1998. There were no more restricted areas for the inspectors. Uh, there were no more delays between the moment where uh, the inspectors were deciding to go to to a specific place in Iraq and the moment they were able to inspect it. And then, um, I think it was uh, end of January, beginning of February, uh, started a, a sort of active cooperation when there was the destruction by uh, Saddam Hussein's regime of the al Samut II missiles. And this is the moment where we started to obviously diverge with the United States because we were saying, well, it works. This is what we wanted. Inspectors are back in Iraq. Uh, al Samut II missiles are being destroyed. Uh, Saddam Hussein is in the sort of a box and the inspectors are in a box as well. So uh, he's under control. He's no more an imminent threat. We know what's happening in Iraq. And this was the moment where 
um, this cooperation was dismissed as insufficient by the American administration, uh, which were saying time has passed, uh, he had a chance to do it earlier, and now let's use force. And did you see a, a difference in the rhetoric of the United States administration before the destruction of the Osmond II missiles and then after? Yes, it was, it was a clear signal to our view that at that moment we were not pursuing the same objective anymore. That is, before, uh, when the inspectors found the al Samut II missiles and had clues that these missiles were um, forbidden because they were able to reach um, a, a length which was not allowed by uh, the Security Council. At that moment, the American administration made it public that um, the destruction of these missiles would be a test of the uh, strong will of the international community. And we were in full agreement with the American administration. Uh, the international community had found these forbidden missiles. Uh, these missiles had to be destroyed. And it was a test of the goodwill of uh, the Iraqi regime if they were able to destroy them. And it was a test of the resolve of the international community to be able to um, force the Iraqi regime to um, destroy the missiles. Uh, and it was stated very clearly, very strongly by the American administration. And then the destruction started. And uh, we, uh, we friends, but we other countries as well, were celebrating this achievement, the idea that the inspections were tough and uh, were proving right, were working. And at that moment, the American administration started saying, well, we knew from the beginning that they would destroy these missiles. It's meaningless. This is not the big stuff. And uh, it was sort of surprising uh, to see a shift in the um, uh, exposed objectives of the, uh, of the international community. And, and talk a little bit about how uh, television diplomatic correspondents uh, you know, pick up on these little shifts? Do they see these patterns at all? Or? Uh, I don't know, you should ask them, but my impression was that um, things were going fast and what had been said the previous week was already forgotten. Uh, there was a lot of uh, public relations made by the administration and they were making the case uh, uh, to go to war. Uh, I was told by uh, American journalists that uh, their job was basically uh, to um, uh, testify about what the American administration was doing and um, to assess whether it was working well or not. Not exactly to know what the rest of the world was thinking about it. And obviously this is what happened at that moment. And do you see kind of like a what they call horse race coverage, who's up, who's down, uh, when, when you're looking at the coverage every day? Uh, well, yes, because uh, important things... I'm sorry. Well, uh, the impression we had was that uh, news cycles were getting shorter and shorter. Uh, uh, people were rushing to news without comparing them to what had happened even the previous week. And, um, and there was sort of a preparation in the media for a... Uh, uh, deciding who would go to Iraq, who would be embedded. From early February, I think, uh, the media were already preparing for a military action. And do you see, a, what differences did you see in the foreign press versus the uh, American press since you Well, uh, many differences, of course. I must say that, for instance, during the, the uh, military operations, for instance, uh, I was watching uh, American TV as well as uh, European TV, either the BBC or the French TV. And I was watching uh, Arab uh, networks as well to be able to understand what was in the um, Arab pu public opinion's mind. And I was obviously watching three different wars. Uh, during, b during the build-up to the war yes. um, is what I'm specifically mm -hmm. focusing on. So what... What differences did you see in, let's say, the French press versus the uh, United States press? There was a difference uh, in, uh, let's say, the European press, uh, because the French press was part of a more general 
um, movement of the European press and the American press. And it was, for instance, the importance given to what Hans Blix was saying in the Unmovic and um, Mohamed El Baradai was saying for IAEA. It was closely uh, followed by the European press and considered as uh, valuable. I mean, they were the uh, highest moral authorities of the international community to the, to the view of the uh, European press. So um, when, uh, when Blix was saying in January that uh, cooperation uh, from Iraq was too slow, uh, European press was impressed by the fact that Blix was tough against the Iraqis. And the European press was starting to think, well, maybe the, Iraqi, uh, the Iraqis are not doing enough, and maybe we should prepare to a military action. After that, when Blix went back to the council saying uh, there is progress made and uh, there is sort of active cooperation which starts, it was a turning point for, for the European press. They were saying, well, so if he says so, he's the one who knows it, so we believe him. And uh, when you look at... Um Um, uh, well, let's, I guess in 1441, they have provisions that said if Saddam does not have a full declaration, and does not give immediate access to scientists, that for the United States, that was enough to go to war. Mm -hmm. And what's your response to that? Uh, 1441 was a resolution which was... Uh, negotiated for weeks for very good reasons. There were two levels of discussions when we discussed uh, 1451. The first one was the question of automaticity, as it was called. This was to decide whether there would be a need for a second resolution uh, if uh, 1441 was not implemented. Uh, a second important part of the discussion was to know exactly what we were expecting from Saddam Hussein. Uh, and that was two things, but two things uh, which had to be done jointly. That was a declaration about what had been done with weapons of mass destruction in the past and full cooperation uh, with the inspectors as soon as they were back in Iraq. And and is a very important word because we discussed that word for quite a while between members of the Security Council. Uh, the idea was to say, well, Saddam is going to make a declaration. We may have our feelings, our views, our, our suspicions about this declaration. But we have not been in Iraq for a while, so we are not certain that what he says is right or that what he says is uh, just a lie. So we cannot determine uh, the position of the international com community simply after reading his declaration. Uh, so we need to have an idea of the declaration and to witness what kind of cooperation he is uh, offering uh, to the inspectors. OK, and, and so if, if the and part of the cooperation is not providing scientists right mm -hmm. away, mm -hmm. Um, does the United States, you know, it seems like, to me, the big picture is that they're looking at technical, you know, violations of 1441 to use as a pretext. Did you ever see that the United States was just using this process as a trigger to go to war? Well, uh, our view was that uh, the ones who would have to assess uh, the level of cooperation uh, were the inspectors. Uh, they were the ones who were on the ground, who had their uh, experience, because even between 1999 and 2002, where they were not in Iraq, they had all their records in New York, so they knew what they were looking after, they knew what they needed, and uh, they knew what kind of obstacles they would face, they knew the ones who would be a real problem. They knew the ones that they would be able uh, to deal with. So we were not saying we know better than the inspectors what they need. And uh, when we negotiated 1441, for instance, 
we were all in favor of very tough inspections. But at the same time, we were saying, let's make the inspection work, so let's ask Hans Blix what he needs. There was an IG, for instance, from the American administration, but which was also coming from American think tanks, which was that the inspectors should be escorted by um, uh, dozens or hundreds of uh, military from the international community, basically from the five permanent members of the Security Council. We were not opposed to the ID, but we asked Hans Blix what he thought about it. And he said, first, I know, don't need them. Second, they would ruin my efforts to surprise the Iraqis. What I need is to have a small team of inspectors uh, taking cars and rushing to a chemical plant or a, uh, to a weapons uh, factory and see what's inside. If I have to be accompanied by hundreds of military, there's no more surprise and uh, there's no more um, uh, tough inspections. So he said, I don't need the military. And we say, okay, if you don't need the military, don't have the military. The question was the same with scientists. Here in Washington, it was considered a big deal that the scientists might be able to meet with the inspectors uh, outside of Iraq and without being recorded. We asked Hans Blix what he was thinking of that. And he was reluctant. He said, well, there are hundreds of ways to put pressure on scientists. If I take one scientist out of Iraq and if I bring him to Cyprus, for instance, and the rest of his family stays in Iraq, he won't be more free to talk to me than if he were in Baghdad. Uh, and uh, he said, we know what we are looking after. So even if the scientists are in Iraq, even if their uh, conversations with us are recorded, as we are going to uh, interview dozens of scientists, we know exactly in which loopholes we are going to investigate. And this question of having the scientists inside Iraq or outside Iraq is not a big deal for the inspectors. In, in the beginning of uh, 2002, the Bush administration was talking a lot about regime change. Mm -hmm. And then in August, it was shifted to weapons of mass mm -hmm. destruction. So in the context of when France is listening to the United States, how does France you know, count these, these public statements that the United States has said about regime change in the context of international law in the UN? Well, to our view, uh, to the, everybody's view, uh, the American president is the commander-in-chief and he decides uh, what is going to be done by his country. So uh, we focused on his speech in the United Nations General Assembly in September 12, 2002, where he mentioned disarmament because of the threat of mass weapons of mass destruction, and when he said that he would go to the UN to search for a new resolution. So to our view, this was the position of the United States. And do you, when you look at the patterns, do you see that the United States wasn't really concerned about weapons inspectors? They didn't want the inspectors to get in. They were calling them feckless and uh, useless. And well, once again, there were obviously divergences in the administration. And from the beginning, uh, uh, we had the feeling that some in the administration were not interested in the inspections. And it was sort of troubling because um, it was a big achievement to have unanimity of the international community uh, in favor of 1441. It was a big achievement that immediately after the resolution, uh, the, the inspectors were admitted in Iraq by, by Saddam Hussein. But we have to admit that um, just after, for instance, just after the president's statement in the General Assembly on September the 12th, um, a few days after, in, on September 16th, uh, came a letter to the uh, UN Secretary General from the Iraqis saying, all right, we accept that the inspectors come back to, to Iraq. It was a very positive step for everybody uh, because we had been waiting for that for years. And in, obviously, uh, the speech from the American president had produced rapid results. The only ones who seemed not to be happy about this uh, Iraqi letter were uh, American diplomats who were saying, how have you seen they accept the inspectors? 
I said, well, yes, that's what you wanted. That's what we wanted. That's good news. It was not good news for everybody in Washington, obviously. And uh, when you look at, uh, you know, during this buildup, there was a lot of General Assembly uh, members coming forward and, and speaking, and, and, and yet not a lot of coverage of, of visually of what they were actually saying. And so can you kind of speak to uh, the support of, of France in the sense that they're not, it wasn't just France? Well, it was not just France who opposed uh, a rush to a war. Uh, but here in the American media, it was, it was seen as a, a dispute between France and the United States. For instance, um, there were several occasions uh, in which members of the, of the uh, General Assembly, members of the United Nations in general, were saying, this is such an important issue, war or peace in the Middle East, we don't want to let it to the uh, members of the Security Council. We want to be able to express our views, all of us, uh, so that people get a sense of what the international community has in mind. And on several occasions before the war, there were a meeting of uh, General Assembly members representing their countries and uh, delivering statements. A vast majority, more than a hundred countries, took the floor to say, we don't want this war now. We don't see the necessity of this war now. We think it's dangerous. We think that it's in a, in a region which has already so many problems that it would even destabilize even more the Middle East. And uh, we don't see why we should go after Saddam Hussein more than after uh, North Korea or Iran or other threatening countries. There was basically no coverage of these debates in the American media. Thank but there was always, always uh, words about France is opposing, France is taking a strong position uh, against the, the United States. And it was never against the United States. It was saying, let's be cautious, let's stick to international principles, let's disarm Iraq peacefully, and only if we um, draw the conclusion that we cannot do it peacefully, should we envisage the uh, military option. So you would also uh, leave open the possibility for uh, military action? In other words. We said it. We said it in public. Oh, sorry, what? Yeah, we, we said in public statements from September 2002 that if Iraq was to be uh, in a new material breach, uh, there would be a meeting of the Security Council, there would be a resolution that we would uh, authorize, we would vote in favor of military action. And not only would we vote in favor, but we would participate as we did in the first Gulf War. And uh, we even sent a mission to the American administration in December 2002 to say that. It was a military mission saying, well, inspectors are back in Iraq for a few days. We don't know what they will find. We don't know how it will work. Uh, let's envisage that it doesn't work. Let's envisage that there is a new material breach uh, acknowledged by the Security Council. Uh, we will vote for the use of force, and in that case, but under these very specific conditions, we will send troops. So be ready to have us on board if there is a new material breach. In, did you ever uh, try to uh, pitch to journalists to try to, you know, cast their net wider to see that it wasn't just France? Or, you know, of course, it was my daily, my daily job. And I I'm must, sorry, uh, my, my daily job was to uh, explain to journalists what was exactly our position and also um, very, very often to tell them, but call my other colleagues, call the Mexicans, call the Chileans, call the Pakistani, because they were all members of the Security Council, call the Russians, call the Chinese, call the Germans, and ask them what they think about uh, the necessity to go to war. Uh, why do you always focus on the French? Of course, we had a very um, prominent figure with our foreign minister who was making a beautiful statements. so the journalists uh, liked very much to focus on him. I say, well, for your readers, for your viewers, uh, they would need to know that uh, the situation is uh, more complex that, than what you think. Uh, many of them knew it, uh, but there was a big difference between what they knew and what they could write, obviously. And so it, it seems that since they weren't writing that, there seemed to be this focus on France and yeah. uh, freedom fries, freedom toast. Can you speak to you know that whole episode? 
Well, it was a very, very unfortunate moment because uh, we would, French bashing, as we saw it last year, which was, uh, I mean, everywhere in the Congress, uh, they turned uh, French fries to freedom fries. Um, uh, some conservative media were uh, uh, using French bashing as a daily uh, recipe for, uh, for their viewers. Uh, it was very unfortunate because there is one thing that we never understood, two things. The first one was that we could disagree between government. I would have understood that there would be strong critics against President Chirac, or the French government, or the French foreign policy. But people were blaming the French for being French. Uh, there were a lot of examples of um, bad jokes or um, insults uh, written or uh, said against the French as a people. And if you, if you read them now, after all this uh, has ended, uh, it's really a kind of... Um, encouragement to hatred and it's extremely shocking especially in a country like the United States which is a country made of immigrants uh, where this kind of behavior should, should never happen. This was the first thing that surprised us. The second thing was that obviously in some parts of the administration uh, this tendency was encouraged and uh, this was uh, really amazing for us that is that you had so-called anonymous sources in the administration which were feeding the media with false allegations against France. And uh, at, a, at a period in February, March, April, it was on a daily basis. We even had to uh, protest uh, publicly. Uh, the ambassadors sent uh, an open letter to the administration, to the Congress and to the media listing a number of false accusations which were sourced by anonymous sources in the administration. And uh, we said, well, what's happening? Why is this the, this need to blame France uh, and to accuse one specific country, which has been a friend and an ally of the United States for several centuries, of things that we have not done? Uh, when we did this, which was very undiplomatic and uh, very unusual, uh, strangely enough, it stopped immediately. And when you look at even now, there seems to be this search for motivations of France. Like it, it must have been, you know, oil for food scandal. I've mm -hmm. talked to a lot of people who have said, "Well, look at the slush funds of the oil for food. That, mm -hmm. You know, they were getting paid off." Uh, can you speak to that? Of course. Uh, once again, uh, when we were expressing. Uh, principles of international law when we are saying you cannot decide of war and peace elsewhere than in the Security Council. Uh, you have to be aware that if you are able to disarm Iraq peacefully you should not use force because it's dangerous, because Iraq has no tradition of democracy and so on and so forth. Uh, some here in the media and elsewhere we are trying to discredit our positions uh, saying the real motivation of France is money or the real motivation of France is oil. Uh, it was easy to dismiss uh, as long as the media were ready and accepting to publish uh, what we were saying to us, to them. That is, for instance, that uh, uh, we were not the first supplier of goods uh, to Iraq through the famous oil for food program, uh, nor the second, nor the third. We were the 13th provider of goods, and Iraq was amounting for 0.20% of our external trade. You don't decide of war and peace for 0.20% of your external trade. This is not reasonable. But time and again, I could read in the conservative media that France was benefiting from uh, the oil for food program, that we are the second provider of goods. It was, it was false. It was simply false. And it was easy to check. Uh, uh, many journalists were calling me saying, but uh, you're making a lot of money with oil for food. I said, well, no, please check. Go to the UN website and you will see which country amounts for 
how much are they for food program? We are 13th provider. We have nothing to gain, nothing to lose with our for food. This is not the problem. Well, I think what they were also saying is that there was uh, Ill illicit funds being, uh, you know, uh, diverted somehow. Is there was there any, you know, illicit funding of oil for food that was happening? Well, something? once again, there has been many accusations in the press. Today, uh, we uh, are all supporting the uh, investigation which has been uh, given to Paul Volcker in the United Nations to know whether. Uh, some money had been diverted from oil for food to know whether UN officials had uh, taken advantage of the oil for food program. I don't know. Uh, I have no clue about it. I have no evidence about it. I never saw any investigation from the Iraqi government uh, focusing on French, either French officials or French individuals. There may be French individuals who took profit of the program, I don't know. There may be other Westerners who took profit of the program, I don't know. Once again, these were accusations in the press. What we all know, and it should be common knowledge, and it should be explained to the uh, public opinion, and strangely, it is not very well explained. It's easy to have a blame game about oil for food to say, well, you know, the UN, you should not give them any responsibility in Iraq because when they were um, uh, dealing with the oil for food program, there was a lot of corruption, a lot of money going out of uh, the program in, to benefit Saddam Hussein. Two things are never said, or not very often, I, I should say. First, the oil for food program was working. This is that when the oil for food program started, Iraqi people were starving. And this is the reason why this program was invented. The sanctions were so tough that people were starving. And the program was able to double the number of calories a day uh, each Iraqi was getting. And it was, it was the focus of the program, give them uh, food and medicine. Second, yes, Saddam Hussein made money with oil during the period of the sanctions. Where did he take his money from? It was mostly, and obviously, and everybody knew it, because he was allowed to sell oil out of the oil for food program to Turkey, to Jordan, with the acceptance of the members of the Security Council, mainly the acceptance of the United States. The idea was that Turkey was suffering from Iraqi sanctions because Turkey was previously a major trade partner of Iraq, and because of the sanctions, it was a, an economic catastrophe for Turkey which is an ally of the United States. The same with Jordan, which is a small country, which could not afford to have its big neighbor under sanctions. And both countries advocated for exceptions to the program, to the sanctions, saying, we need Iraqi oil at a favorable price to be able to have uh, our economy going on. And it was accepted by all security members knowing that it would provide Saddam Hussein with billions of dollars without any control out of the Alpha Food program. So we all know that Saddam made money, made billions of dollars uh, selling oil to Turkey and to Jordan. This is obvious. We know it. It was a price to pay not to have the collapse of Jordan and not to have the collapse of Turkey. And uh, when you look at the Security Council as an entity, you do have this phenomenon of each individual country acting in their own self-interest. And I think when you look at um, the coverage of the, the television news on France, you saw a lot of, like, France is doing this because of the oil contracts. And when I talked to Lawrence Grossman, formerly president of NBC News, he said, when I asked him what the French position was, he said, well, they just wanted oil. And I said, well, that's not what they were saying. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the actual you know, oil in the context of well, all the United Nations Security Council, you know, the contracts with Russia, contracts with mm -hmm. France, and contracts with the United States. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to, to that? Well, first, Iraq was under sanctions uh, for a decade, so there was no oil contract, no contract for uh, French oil companies uh, to uh, explore and exploit oil in Iraq. There was none. 
And when it was written in the American press that we had our own interest because Total, because Total Fina Health had oil contracts with uh, Iraq, no. We were, by, uh, we were following sanctions. It was forbidden to sign any contract with Iraq during the sanctions period. So that's not true. Uh, second, I would like people to explain to me why, for instance, Mexico or Chile were opposing the idea of going to war. They had no specific economic interest in Iraq, that's for certain. And their specific economic interests were with the United States. So they were taking a, a, a bold position, opposing a war that was favored by the American administration. It only means that uh, this way of reading the debates in the Security Council as countries protecting their own greedy interests maybe missed the point. That is, Mexico was aware that it, its position opposing the war would create anger in the United States. Still, they stuck to their position. Canada, which is the other neighbor and best friend of the United States, was not in the Security Council, but Canada took a strong position saying that they opposed the war. Uh, did they have any economic interest in Iraq? No. Well, I think what uh, people were picking up on was that here's France, they have dirty hands in the past, they've, they've intervened in other countries without UN approval, and here they are making a principled stand on international law. There must be something going on. Well, there are different things. Um, first, uh, dirty hands in the past. We have our own colonial experience. That is, that we had wars uh, unauthorized by the Security Council, opposing the uh, natural tendency of our former colonies to claim their independence. But we drew lessons from this experience. That is, we had the Algerian War, we had the war in Indochina before your own Vietnam War, and uh, it learned us a few things. First, that you, ne you should never underestimate Arab nationalism. This is obviously what we did in Algeria. We were able to win the war militarily and we lost the war politically because Algeria, even if the um, uh, Algerian insurgents were weaker than we were militarily, uh, the unity of the Algerian people in favor of their independence was so strong that we had to acknowledge and leave. Uh, so yes, we had our own bad wars, but we tried to draw lessons from that. And uh, for decades now, we have been advocating, uh, as founding members of the United Nations, as the United States are, for um, respect of the international law, respect of the UN Charter, which means that uh, you go to war uh, in very specific circumstances. Either you're in a situation of self-defense. And for instance, you have to know that France took the decision to propose a resolution just after September 11th in 2001 to um, reform, renew the international law, uh, deciding that the United States had been attacked by terrorists and that a terrorist attack was uh, equivalent to an act of war and that so the United States was allowed to uh, retaliate as an act of self-defense. It was brand new in the international law because it had never happened before to that extent. And France had t taken the lead to uh, this reform in the international law in favor of the United States. But this is one situation in which you're allowed to go to war, that is self-defense. You've been attacked, you, you retaliate. The other situation is a Security Council resolution under chapter, chapter 7 of the, of the Charter. This is what we've been doing for years, for decades. This is under this basis that we have troops in Bosnia, that we have troops in Kosovo, that we have troops, we had troops in Haiti with the United States, that we have troops in Côte d'Ivoire. Each time uh, there were humanitarian emergencies in Kosovo, in Bosnia, there was ethnic cleansing. In Côte d'Ivoire, there was the risk of huge massacres. And each time, we went on the basis of a Security Council resolution. And uh, when you look, look at uh, 
going back to uh, February 5th, 2003, mm -hmm. can you describe what that day was like for you? It was a tough day. Uh, Sept um, February 5th, 2003 was the day where uh, Colin Powell went to the Security Council and to make the case for war, to make his presentation about what he thought was uh, the imminent threat posed by uh, Saddam Hussein. It was a difficult day because uh, we have the deepest admiration for Colin Powell. We considered that he was saying what he knew, what he believed. The problem was that we were not sharing the same knowledge, nor the same beliefs. For instance, the idea that uh, Saddam Hussein had something to do with Al-Qaeda and was with September 11th was completely rejected in Europe. Not because of uh, ideology, but because of experience, because uh, Europe has faced, and France notably, has faced uh, Islamic terrorism for decades. It started in, in the 80s, and 86, 93, 95, we faced Islamist terror in the streets of Paris, in Paris subway. And we have had um, terrorist, anti-terror experts, judges, um, law enforcement experts, who have been working on terrorist networks for decades. And they kept on repeating, even publicly, that to their view there was no link between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda. So we were not buying this part of the, uh, of the case. On weapons of mass destruction, we had doubts, we had questions, we had uh, suspicions, but we were saying, seeing no imminent threat. For instance, we were listening to what was said by al Barada in IAEA regarding nuclear weapons. Uh, in February, he was saying, give me one more month and I think I will be able to tell you that there is no nuclear program going on in Iraq. And I mean, he's the expert. And nuclear programs is not something that you hide behind under the carpet. It's visible, it's big. It requires imports and requires networks. You had nothing of this kind in Iraq. We were more skeptical about chemical weapons, uh, not to mention biological weapons, because our idea was that even if Saddam had had biological weapons, it's not so easy to keep, and we were not sure whether he still had them. Regarding chemical weapons, we were not sure. We didn't know, and we wanted the inspectors to help us know. But not to know whether uh, Iraq had or didn't have chemical weapons was not a sufficient re reason to go to war. So the presentation on February the 5th was, well, yes, there are question marks. Yes, there are suspicions. Uh, this is exactly why we have sent the inspectors in Iraq. Let, let them do their job and we'll see. And what was the reaction that you heard from the journalists, what were they? It was an amazing reaction from the American medias after the uh, presentation of Colin Powell on the 5th. They were all convinced. Because Colin Powell is an American idol, because uh, he, he's someone, he put all his personal weight behind his presentation, and the journalists all said, well, no, he's right, no, we're convinced. You should be convinced too. And I received tons of messages or phone calls saying, well, at last, we hope you're convinced. And I say, well, we are convinced that the inspectors should do their job. This is what we are convinced of, nothing else. And regarding the question of Saddam and Al-Qaeda, we don't buy it. And uh, there was a kind of uh, anger against our position that day because Colin Powell had put his weight in the fight. And when you jump uh, to March 7th, when al said that aluminum tubes were not for nuclear weapons, Niger documents, and that was the same day that the United States had put a 10-day ultimatum on Saddam Hussein. Well, it was covered in the press. We, I could not say it was not covered. But more and more, it has lost a prominent position in the press. You have to open your newspaper and look for uh, al Baradai's report and say, well, Interesting, aluminum tubes, he doesn't believe it was for nuclear weapons. 
uh, it was very difficult for uh, American public opinion to get a sense of what was going on in the Security Council and in the IAEA. And do you have a sense that the American media had kind of blinders on of like only concerned about the United States and not really listening to a lot of different perspectives? Or? Well, it's a general tendency. Uh, international coverage was not very um, efficient in the 90s in the United States. Uh, you have to know that many um, uh, bureaus uh, of the American media abroad were closed during that period because there was uh, a lack of interest from the viewers, especially in, uh, in TV networks, for what was happening elsewhere. Uh, I talked to many newspapers, to many uh, TV networks, and asked them what had happened because, for instance, very few American media had a bureau in Paris. And even their bureau chiefs were supposed to be a Paris correspondents, but were working at the same time about Turkey, Jerusalem, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and I was complaining about that. I was saying, well, if you have, want to have proper coverage of what's happening in France, if you want me to help you get access to prominent French uh, decision makers, I would need to have your correspondent spending more than two days a month in Paris because when I call him to tell him well if you want to talk to the minister he might be available the guy tells me well well right now I'm in Kabul doing something else uh, so this is what had happened in the 90s more and more money and more and more uh, means were put in domestic issues in covering uh, the West Coast or uh, the Midwest uh, in covering uh, uh, trials or um, really domestic issues and less and less on international uh, uh, relations and on uh, bureaus abroad. Very few um, American journalists were able to speak Arabic uh, and the ones who were sent to Iraq, for instance, very few of them were speaking Arabic and of course it makes things more difficult to explain things to your viewers or to your readers. When you come to a country you have not been posted there for a while and um, you don't speak the language, you don't know the people, you have to struggle for access. Uh, it makes things more difficult. And to, do you see the, the result of the American population kind of being in a bubble and not really knowing what's, what's going on and outside of the... Well, this is natural. I mean, 300 million people, this is natural that they focus on their own domestic issues. You cannot blame them for that. But what I don't understand is that Sometimes I'm told by media, oh, you know, we don't make too much international coverage because people are not interested. But how could they be interested if you don't provide them with the international coverage of good quality? Uh, it's a question of who started first. And uh, I'm not certain that the answer of the media, which is to say, you know, we don't do it because they are simply not interested or it's too complicated. I say, okay, explain them. I mean, it might be complex. But the international situation uh, for the United States after September 11th and at a moment where American troops are in Afghanistan and in Iraq, your viewers, your readers have to know what happens. And when you look at um, the, the importance of international law, a lot of, I've had a lot of walls of it, it's just not important. So could you explain, you know, summarize why international law it should be important? Well, we all live in a globalized world. Uh, we all speak of globalization all day long. Uh, so if we are in a globalized world with uh, rising economic powers, with uh, failing states at the same time, it means that this world might be dangerous. Uh, and in a dangerous world, you have to have rules of the game. Uh, America is the current superpower. It's a good news because America is a democratic country. In the coming decades, we don't know whether we will see or not emerge new superpowers with less democratic values. Let's imagine, for instance, that in the coming decades, China becomes a big military superpower. It can happen. It's already a big economic uh, growing superpower. And if you don't have rules of the game about who is entitled 
to use military force to do what? With the approval of who? It could become the law of the jungle. It's the same thing with uh, environment. You know that there is a big diver divergence between the United States and Europe about the necessity to sign and ratify the Kyoto Protocol about uh, environment. We share the same planet. We cannot say, well, we love our way of living, we love uh, spending a lot of energy for our SUVs or uh, our air condition, and uh, we are pretty certain that in the coming decades we will have make uh, a scientific progress and we'll be able to find new energies. We don't know. And as we don't know, and as obviously there is a problem with, uh, uh, with the climate uh, for the time being, let's work together. Let's have international laws enforced so that there is not one bully in the classroom who decides what he wants to do despite of the others. And we are not saying we are anti-American. We are um, concerned that any country considering it is big enough to do what he wants, might decide to invade its neighbor or uh, to refuse uh, international law considering uh, protection of the sea, for instance. We have to give the example to set the rules of the game because we have one single planet to take care of. Okay, great. And we're just going to sit here for 10 seconds.